Happy Thursday, everyone. Welcome. We're back with another episode, if you will, of uh, Nature Mysticism Discussion with Don Zane Kerfman and Melissa and myself. And today we're going to kind of have the starter topic of what llamas are in the tradition or what they're kind of, at least that's what I, I chose yesterday. I haven't talked to Zane about it yet, so I hope that's a good topic for him. <laughs> What what llamas are? Well, not just not what llamas are, but being of service and their and their symbolism uh, that we use in the tradition. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, because, absolutely. Because llamas were a hot minute were like this big thing. Like everybody wanted llamas. There was carvings of llamas, llamas everything. Even like Anya has like a little llama thing. Uh, so yeah. like, well, llamas are cool. I mean, they, they really are cool animals. Um, cool cameloids. Uh, Anyway, yeah, so in the tradition, they're very important, especially to the indigenous people of the high Andes. Life is pretty much impossible without them. Uh, they need, um, so the llamas, though they're kind of taken care of by the people and they herd them kind of like shepherds herd uh, sheep, uh, it's a little bit different too because they don't so much lock them into areas and put up fences and things like that. The llamas actually choose to hang out with the uh, with the Caro and the other indigenous peoples there that are taking care of them. And they have a celebration every year. Uh, and it's the celebration of the llama where they'll go and they'll build them with stones, like a little castle, not with roofs and everything, but a little castle. And it will be kind of like a maze. And, and they'll go in and they'll find all these foods that they love. And they get to, they, they weave them hats and they, weave them different types of clothing to wear during that time. And it's to honor the llama because the llama give everything. Uh, they, they are like the, the quintessential symbol of service. Uh, you know, they, they carry the heavy packs up the mountains. And, and in those mountains, even horseback is not a good way to get things in and out of there. There are these small Spanish horses called uh, peso horses. And they use those because they can actually put one foot in front of the other and hike up those trails uh but there's a lot of loose rock and things like that and horses really don't like that uh but the uh, llama can really get up through there so that you can pack your goods on the llama and it will carry it so it's a beast of burden in that way but even more than that it uh gives of its dung its dung is the fuel for the fires that they cook their meals on in the high andes because one, it's above the tree lines. We're talking 16 to 21,000 feet above sea level. So there's no trees growing up there. And two, it's really hard to start a fire. So you need something with uh, high uh, fuel content and llama dung is the perfect thing. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, so they start all their fires and most of their fires are just llama dung. Uh, they also give of their milk for the young there uh, so that the babies have food to eat. And all their clothing is woven from the llamas. That they make cheese out of their um, milk. And so the llama really gives everything. And then when times are really desperate, when times are really tough, the llama will even lay down and give its life for the family and allow, uh, to allow the survival of the family. So in that way, the llama is um, a representation, especially of our in our uh, Mishas or our Mesa spreads is a representation of the sacred quality of life. Uh, that's one of the uh, capacities we're trying to develop as people on this path is that compa capacity to give, to be an Aini, to, to be in a sacred reciprocity with the universe around us. So the Lama really represents that and represents service and in a very real way is connected to Quichi, which is the rainbow spirit, uh, and also connected to um, the soul level medicine uh, of our tradition. Very good. Well, that's a, a really good intro for, or maybe it's the whole topic. We'll see. But we yeah. have Rich, Richie just saying good morning. Good morning, Richie. And, and the 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 Twitch comments always throw me, Melissa. So you should. I th well, I think I got it. So the, Kathy says good morning, and then this one's just a hello. Hi. And then we have Magical Mike saying a Nike Kawaii. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And today's topic really was inspired because we always have so much emphasis on llamas in this tradition, or, or especially when you're building despacho and we talk about the representation of all the different items that llamas have such a significant. Um, are such a significant thing for the Caro in that tradition. And then yeah. it's a, a good representation of the reason that we do this work. 
a lot of, a lot of it, even if you're not going to be a, a actual healer or, you know, put up a shingle, like Zane says, and like um, have C clients as healing is to be an energy of being able to be in service and reciprocity, which is what Zane just kind of synopsized. Yeah. Yeah. Service is very important in this tradition. You know, that's one of the things that that's how we grow. Uh, I hate to use technical language, our I need though. That's how we grow our reciprocity with the universe and we cooperate with the universe energetically is through service. And as we are able to step uh, deeper and deeper into serving the universe around us, we receive more and more. It's the idea that, uh, you know, the it's the difference between Chaya, which is the idea of mercantile exchange. You get what you pay for and that's all you get and Aini, which is something that keeps giving. Aini is a quality that never stops giving. So when we're in those, uh, that's what we're trying to develop because as we are able to be in more harmony with our universe, we start to be able to grow our personal power. And our personal power is the sum total of what we're able to bring to this world, what we're able to offer others. And, and that's how it works is our personal power grows because we offer it to others uh, and it grows in uh, myriad ways. And so we can actually develop and transform all of us, no matter who you are, even if you don't join a spiritual tradition like this, everyone is a healer and everyone is a teacher on the rudimentary level because those are the two services that we provide as humans to other humans at all times unless we totally uh, encapsulate ourselves or isolate ourselves from the rest of humanity we're always going to pl uh, be playing that role of a healer or a soother and a teacher uh, because there's things that we learn there's things that we understand there's things that we just have natural talents for and even though we have we might have a natural talent for it we can uh learn to translate the wisdom of that natural talent so that other people can develop more that direction as well so no matter what we're uh healers and teachers in this uh, uh path and as we grow our personal power we are better we have better capacity or are better able to serve humanity and that's really the goal of it is we're serving humanity and serving nature itself and as we do that we are changing the dynamics of the universe around us because we are taking it on personally personal responsibility to be the change in our environment to be the change in our communities uh, that will lead to uh, greater harmony and in that way, our communities, our environments also grow personal power from our interactions with them. Very good. We had a couple more. We had a chair bear saying no drama llama. <laughs> Another good morning. And we have our dear Nahama saying Sammy and I send our love. Our friend a mile away has three llamas. So she has some llamas, awesome. right? right next to her that's that, now we know where we can get some yama fat possibly right yeah well yeah. if they if they butcher them most people don't oh, yeah. yeah that's uh, true you don't we don't want to we don't want to butcher yeah and, and of course in the tradition and people will see this if they look uh you often find that there is a yama fetus uh that is offered to pachamama in the hierarchies, the despacho the offerendas the mesa blanca ceremonies you'll see this uh uh llama fetus now there's a reason for that it isn't that llama baby llamas are killed in the tradition no they're way too important what it is is that the mother llamas have a high abortion rate so most of the the calves are never born alive they the, most of them are are aborted before that and so you know, being a very practical people and the Lama being a symbol of Pachamama, one of the symbols of her, you know, this is an offering that they'll give back, you know, because it was aborted, they will take it and they'll put it in their offerings and give it back to the Pachamama. And even the ancient despachos, you know, today we use paper. Uh, paper is a common uh, ingredient, but the ancient ones were woven fabrics, were very plain woven um fabrics from llama uh, fur and that our llama wool and then you know you you built your offering in it and then you put the the um, cloth and the offering into the fire both now of course paper is a little bit more um, a, a little bit more 
sustainable in a sense than mm -hmm. uh, than using your llamas like that. Uh, but the textiles, especially, there is a whole school of understanding within the textiles themselves, where the textiles are prayers that are woven together, that weave together the masculine and feminine. But the only way that you could weave that is with the llama fur, because that's what they had. That was their natural fabric uh, in the Andes. Uh, so, you know, uh, taxes, the, the ancient Mita system, the tax system of the Inca, the majority of the taxes were paid in textiles and in potato seeds, showing just how important these things were, uh, you know. And even today in the traditional communities, oftentimes when you're uh, paying for your initiation or you're paying for a healing or you're paying for a ceremony, a lot of times you didn't at least I have to say things have changed in the last 20 years or so, but originally it wasn't a token-based economy because so few of the indigenous people had any type of finances. Now, of course, uh, that's a little bit different. Uh, they're still extremely poor, but that's a little bit different. But in the ancient uh, or in the older way of doing things, when you paid for your initiations, you paid for your healings, you often paid with llamas. You would give llamas, you'd give textiles, and you'd give potatoes because these are the things of life. These are the things that continue to allow us to survive from year to year uh, and to move forward. And of course, the Paco, uh, which is our name for a priest, means nature mystic. The uh, Paco that you paid with that, that's theirs uh, in a very real sense. But because everything is about service and everything is about growing your personal power and Aini, they see it as they're safekeeping it. If they need to use it while they while it's in their care, they will. If they need to eat the potatoes, if they need to use the textiles. But you often see that the Pacos, everyone else has nothing in their house. They might have a bag of rice on the floor, a bag of potatoes on the floor, and that's about it, you know in their entire house, which is smaller than the room I'm in right now. Um, and then you go to a Paco's house and you'll, the entire floor is just covered with sacks of potatoes and sacks of rice and hanging from the rafters is ponchos and textiles. And they look extremely wealthy in that way, but it is, they're the number one source when something happens, when, uh, you know, uh, part of your village, maybe, a half a mile, two miles down the mountain uh, gets flooded or, uh, you know, uh, a house falls in or that someone loses their crop. It's that Paco's job to serve, even though that was his payment. It, it's their job to make sure that the community is taken care of. So even though they hold storehouses full of items and look very wealthy in one sense, in another sense, uh, most of those items end up being given back to that community uh, as, uh, as well, even though the Paco has the right to use them any way they see fit. It might be that they're going to send it two communities over because they had a disaster, uh, because it, that's the way you survive there. And at night, um, I, you know, there's no street lights. Uh, there's barely electric bulbs. I mean, every, uh, uh, there's villages here and there that have electric bulbs, but they're on solar power and everything. So, uh, you know, they only have them for a couple hours and then they go out. But at night, you can actually find your way around the pitch black mountains because the starlight and the moonlight reflect off of the wool of the llamas. So the llamas actually are like street lamps up there. So as you're walking, you can tell where you can go because, well, a llama's not levitating above the earth, you know, in the mountain paths. It's actually on the mountain. So you can tell, oh, I'm safe because I can see the dim glow of the llama. And they just sit there. They're very, they're very peaceful animals. They might spit on you if they get scared, but that's about it. Yeah. We had Richie saying he just finished your book. And if you want a book of Zanes, Melissa has them. I have them. Just reach out and you can get that. Melissa will get it to you a lot faster than me. But, <laughs> I'm she has, glad. Bring your she book. A, I'll sign yeah, it, Richie. Yeah, she has a store and uh, minions to, to get all that done. And then uh, Ricky is saying good morning. And before he gets in the next question, uh, we were Melissa and I were just talking before we started the stream about how llamas is such a has been such a big boom and things. Um, Melissa, did you have any any anything that hasn't been answered already before oh. we? Because the question might take us in a different direction. Well, I. I think it may be important to point out, you know, we up here in North America, like 
we don't have llamas everywhere. So this was a question in one of the first years, like, what do you do in certain ceremonies that, you know, normally you would be using, you know, llama fat, like, yeah. how do we work around that up here in North America? Well, you know, it's really about um, discovering what uh, works for you. And part of that is your own moral compass on these things as well. You know, for the most part, uh, you can use, you wouldn't, uh, you know, if you want to use the closest thing, you could use lamb fat or you could use cow fat. They wouldn't use pig fat at all because it's just a different type of animal and it has a different quality because all animals, all food and all humans have either a warm, neutral or cold energy uh, in the Andes. And I don't go into that all the time because uh, there's easier ways for us to understand it here. But our health is is based around that. So, uh, you know, that's why there's certain animals that you would use the fat of certain animals you wouldn't use the fat of. But, uh, you know, I use ghee, I use butter, <laughs> I use butter a lot or ghee, uh, that works pretty well. I mean, if it's really hot out, it's not going to stick together as well. And if you're just really uh, health conscious or, uh, or if you don't like to use animal products, you can use things like olive oil. Uh, you can use things like coconut oil for most offerings. There's certain offerings where that just won't do uh, because it, of the nature of the spirit that you're offering to. Like when we do offerings to the terracuna, you know, they don't really want uh, coconut oil and they don't really want uh, olive oil because that isn't a symbolic representation. The things that we offer spirits, we offer them because it's within their spiritual vibration. We don't just offer it because, oh, it's nice. Oh, this is a beautiful thing, and and I think it would like it. If we offer it because it's within a spiritual vibration or within its domain of signatures, uh, its energy quality. So by having certain things like a red candle, well, if you light a red candle for a spirit that likes green, it may not come, you know. Uh, because the color itself is vi has a vibration that is not complementary to it. And that's the same thing with offerings. So, uh, but in those cases, you know, what I, I tend to tell people to offer is a feather. Uh, you know, uh, pick up a feather out in nature. Uh, it hasn't harmed anything, but it holds the quality that uh, connects with that, uh, with that energy. So we would use something like that, an animal product that uh, is sustainable and doesn't harm anything you could also use wool or llama fur right as well all right i'm going to bring up this question first because it's in line with what you just talked about we will circle back to the other ones nahama is asking what is the terracuna oh terracuna is the little nature spirits that protect sacred sites uh and even sites that we don't know are sacred it's like when you're walking in nature and you start to feel like you're being followed or you start to feel like something's watching you that they, they really are called the watchers uh but they have the job of keeping the um beauty and the energy of a sacred site so in other words they have the job of making sure it's not polluted not disrespected and they do that to uh partly to the degree of the people who are there you know of course if you have a bunch of uh, kids that are hiking through the woods and they just happen on a sacred site, they might not know the per correct sacredness, uh, the correct way to approach that. So the Terracuna would understand that because they're living entities. But especially for someone who is a Paco or a nature mystic or something like that, they understand that you know better. So they demand more of you and they ask more of you to open up because you're doing it for all those people who don't know how because that's your responsibility. So uh, they're the ones that watch and keep the sacred sites sacred. You know, uh, there's uh, stories uh, like in Machu Picchu of people being struck by lightning sometimes or things like that happening. And that's because the sacredness, the under, traditional understanding is the sacredness has not been upheld because of laws and rules that are 
uh, guard uh, that uh, now govern certain sanctuaries and certain archaeological sites in Peru, you're no longer allowed to do offerings, even as an indigenous person. It used to be you weren't allowed to do offerings, but if you were indigenous, they'd let you. Now they'll let you still come, do kind of like your ceremony, but you have to not do an offering in most of those places. You can't do the despachos. You can't do those things there. Uh, so, you know, it creates kind of a, an imbalance in the energy fields there. Uh, and uh, that can slowly lead to a point where, you know, like my teachers would say, the site becomes corrupted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like there's a site in Cusco, very sacred site. It's the Temple of the Moon. Yet many of my teachers would say that the energy there is uh, mm -hmm. corrupted or compromised because it's a park. It's not, you know, it's like a park we go to, you know, where kids just run around and, and couples go to hide behind the hill and make out and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's not being treated as a sacred uh, place anymore. Uh, so the energies are still there, but they're more underground and under the surface. And, uh, you know, the Terracunas are the ones that watch over that. They're kind of like the Akuku of the, uh, like, Kodoriti and stuff. They're the guardians. Very good. And Ricky, you can definitely, add, or Richie, you can ask a question from the book and I will get to it in a moment. I'm going to do chair bear and then we'll go to Judy's comment next. Uh, but she was, this is just kind of in line with the, the starter topic of llamas. What is the difference between llama and alpaca? Not just the difference, I like get it, clearly it's a different animal, but how do the indigenous look at them any differently? Does the alpaca have any, any place within the tradition or is it a completely- It has the alpaca? exact same place. Uh, it, it is the llama and the alpaca that are looked at the exact same way within the okay. tradition. Okay, very good. And then- uh, But they Judy's do know that the, the differences between them. Yeah, well, the differences between them, and I believe that the alpaca, they, do, well, anyway, that's a comment for a different different day. Judy was asking, you spoke of our power growing through the offering of service. How much does the receiving of this service matter in the exchange at an interpersonal level? Will our power still grow if the offering isn't being received by whoever we're offering it to? So, well, yeah, that's a great question. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that that was the end of the question. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you know, um, the offering is energetic in nature, regardless of its physical uh, representation or its physical form that it's taking. So an offering of Aini is always an offering of Aini, uh, you know, uh, and, and that energy is always there. Um you know, I, I took your question in two, two different ways. One a way I took it was if you're doing if you're offering a service and someone's too proud or some other way to receive it, how does that affect you? Well, that doesn't affect you at all. That affects them. That that's on their their level. You've already made the offering. You already put the energy forward. It's on their level. Uh, the opposite, though, if you're really good at giving service, but uh, impossible at receiving it, then that is a breakdown in Aini as well. We have to learn to be uh, perfect givers and per per perfect receivers to, in order for our Aini to grow. We have to, uh, and perfect giver doesn't mean you have to give to every cause and everything that comes your way. That's not uh what it is it's it's when you know it's right or you have you know that you feel to do it and then you don't do it uh that that's uh the criteria there uh we can't help everyone and we can't help everyone all the time but we can only do what's within our measure of power and our measure of power grows by offering service and receiving service it's not just a one-way street there's many people out there who are great givers and, but they're terrible receivers. And if you look at their life, their inability to receive, it, it causes obstructions in their life, causes uh, problems in the way that they're able to uh, enjoy their life. Very good. Hopefully that answers the question. And if there's a follow-up, feel free to put that out there. And then Richie, his question from your book is, did I understand it right that through the program I will learn to control more or less of his anxiety and depression. Absolutely, yeah. You learn to uh, approach it in a different way is what really happens there. It's not, uh, it, it's, it's learning to approach it in a way that allows more potentials and more possibilities with it. Uh, you know, 
anxiety and depression are there for a reason. I don't tend to follow the idea that they're there for uh, a lesson to be learned. Uh, and that once you learn the lesson, these things go away. I don't think of that. I don't think that way with illnesses either. I believe that there are, there's information in everything and there's something that we can learn about everything, but the learning of it doesn't make these things go away, but the understanding of it can transform our experience of it. So uh, we learn to make use of these states, uh, to make use of them and, and to uh, that uh, lessens the impact that they have on us. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've worked with a lot of people who have crippling anxiety and what ends up happening is that they their anxiety goes down notches. Yeah, I don't know if their anxiety goes down notches or if their ability to digest it, their ability to interact through it and their ability to use it uh, purposefully as a gift. You see, uh, one of the secrets about all of that is your anxiety, your depression is you. And when you're fighting it and you're trying to push it away, you're pushing away a quanta of life force energy, a vital energy that's yours. And it's offline because you can't uh, touch it because it's locked up in something. And that's something that's locked up in we often call like imprints. And those imprints are, are rooted from certain root experiences in our lives. And those root experiences um, when we start to heal those, when we start to transform the nature of those in a very real sense, the uh, intensity of the anxiety, the intensity of the depression changes the, and our ability to learn how to manage it changes. Our ability to learn how to flow with it and, and live with it changes. So in a very, uh, in the most honest way, yes, uh, the exercises and the teachings of the tradition really do help you to do that. They, they will help you to change things, but it's not an intellectual thing. It's not something we learn up here. And because we know it up here, it changes our lives out here. It's something we have to actively um, participate in. We have to actively do the work and we actively do it in the laboratory of our lives. And what I mean by that is, our, our normal way of dealing with something like anxiety or depression is to push it away from us, to kind of al allow it, because in some ways we can't uh, completely turn it off or it wouldn't be a problem if we were just sure. able to turn it off, but it's still there at some level and, and it becomes part of our lives. And so what, uh, what ends up happening is if we can quit reacting to it, if we can become very clear and observe it from the position of a witness. And we can watch our anxiety, we can watch our depression, and we can observe it for all it's worth. Then in that moment, we can apply one of the tools of the technique. And if we apply that tool, we'll have an experience. And every time we apply that tool in that way, and we have that experience, and we won't do it every time because we're humans and we won't always remember, we won't always be able to go into the witness, we won't always be able to do that. But every time we do, we start to wire uh, neurons together inside of our nervous system. See, we're taking a deliberate control by doing the energetics. We're taking a deliberate control of the nervous system, not through a mental uh frame of mind, not through an emotional state of being, but from a spiritual perspective, we take deliberate control of our neurology. The more we do that and the more that we have an experience of those things changing, the stronger the neural net becomes. And then eventually it's like any other skill you learn, you start to do it automatically instead of having to uh, uh, say, oh, now I'm going to apply this tool to this situation in my life. Suddenly you're just applying it without even knowing you're applying it anymore. And it becomes a permanent change in the way that you handle those situations. So yeah, it will, uh, the, the, especially the apprenticeship, uh, and how we work with these things and how we move through all of this will have a direct and uh, powerful result on those uh, issues. 
Very good. We had Karen just uh, thanking for teaching how to letting the river flow instead of trying to push it. And, and Judy was making the comment that it sounds like we're learning how to be an Aini with ourselves. First with ourselves. We can't be an Aini with the universe around us if we're not an Aini with ourselves. Uh, first, you know, that's uh, between the ways we think, the ways we feel and the ways we behave. When we start to have a coherence between those three aspects of ourselves that in the tradition we call Yankai, Munai, and Yachai, when we start to, and those are our powers. What, what do, why do we call those our powers? Because they're perceptive centers called pukyos uh, on, the, uh, on our body. And they're places where energy ex freely moves out and freely moves in and manifest really quickly into physical form. So these three uh, ways are the ways that we interpret the world around us and what we broadcast back into it. We broadcast and interpret through our minds, through our feelings, and through our actions. And when we bring those into greater harmony with each other, creating a greater Aini uh, with, with it, we develop a certain level of personal power. And that doesn't mean that, oh, this person didn't upset me when they did this. It means that even though I'm upset, I can choose to um, respond in a different way to them. Or I can choose and respond upset to them because maybe that's the perfect medicine for that moment. <laughs> but I will know that better because I'm in harmony with myself instead of just having imprints tapped on or activated and then reacting to an older wound in my uh, history. I think that's a really good point with the, just that it's okay to respond sometimes with anger or being upset because sometimes that it's not necessarily a wrongness. And I think we, especially as kids and parents telling you stop acting a certain way and all that, we're, we're sometimes taught that being or being in any sort of particular way is like a big wrongness. And uh, Virtue is just uh, thinking, saying that's, that this is great. It basically becomes muscle memory after applying it for so long. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And at that point, it's no longer something you're doing. Uh, it's something you are. You're, you move from doing to being. It becomes yeah. a state of being. It's embodiment. Yeah. How you doing over there, Melissa? No, I'm good. And just answering questions offline that I get cool. texted. So, um, no, and, and that's one of the, I, if you want to call it a selling point, um, so many people come in and issues with like anxiety and just feeling out of control and how to deal. And I'm like, this is the series that really is going to benefit you mm -hmm. the most, you know? Um, I'm like, make it at least through, what is it, the first three or four weekends, because I think those are the most beneficial in some of that, and then process, drop out if you have to, join us the next time, but, um, you know, that, that's that been kind of like, of all the things that I've known, that of all I've, that I've sat in, that I've trained in, I'm like, this is the one that's going to help the most mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. so, what one reason I think that is, is because it's so tailored to the students that are in that particular run. It has never been, the, but though there is an underlying formula and we'll talk about, it has never been the same training twice. Yeah, it, it's, we, we have to adapt with, we're, and we're adapting with more than just the students. The, the students that are inside of uh, the container we create, they actually create the parameters of it. But there's another uh, interesting energy and that's history, and that's uh, current events, and that's all these things also lend an energy to what it, what and how things are taught each year. You know, uh, current events, you know, there's times when there's economic downturns or economic upturns or uh, things like that. Just like when we were in the um, midst of the uh, COVID um uh, pandemic, that year we focused a whole lot on soul retrieval and a whole lot on healing because that's a collective trauma that humanity has not healed from yet. We actually are doing that little job of pushing it under right now, you know, of saying, oh no, everything's back to normal. You know, everything's going fine. Everything will be, we won't have to worry about that again. But uh, we haven't dealt with what it, it has done yet. And it hasn't finished with our culture yet, with our, uh, with the way that we live and the way that we look at life. We're just at a point where uh, we're, we're just trying to put it, uh, put it away for now. 
but it will continue to inform us. It, it was a major event and, and it's power to impact our world in a positive way is so amazing. Uh, if we can look at it and look at the data that uh, came up and look at how our communities are ready for it. And of course, we can't ever be completely ready for something like that. But what can we do on the communal level, on the personal level, so that if another occurrence like that were to happen, we are better prepared uh, to take care of uh, the uh, situation. We're better prepared to take care of each other. Yeah, you know, another big one is water, you know, uh, and with the eclipse coming up, you know, a lot of people are afraid of uh, solar flares and stuff that might interrupt uh, interrupt our electronic devices. And if that happens, you know, uh, just what was it, 2012, I think it was, we had uh, something in this part of Ohio called the Derincio, and it was basically like uh, uh, a, a mixture of a torrential downpour that continued for day uh, for a very long time with high speed winds and tornadoes in an area that just isn't used to that kind of uh, quality, uh, that kind of weather. And, you know, just in this region, uh, Southeast Ohio, West Virginia, um, people were without power for over two or three weeks, not, not days, weeks, two or three weeks because the infrastructure was so destroyed. And uh, it only took like three or four days before people started looting and started robbing places and all kinds of other things because we don't have good systems in place to take care of our communities when we have something like that happen. And especially now, as much as we rely on um, the glow, the, this information system, uh, you know, our finances are, I would say, 95% electronic now you know maybe a little less than that and i don't see that changing uh um you know anytime soon uh i, I see that just uh, it growing in its percentage of how, of how much is used electronically so you know uh, what would we do in the event of uh, another big blackout another big infrastructure breakdown where there is no electronics no uh, no energy in that form for a while, how would we uh, take care of ourselves uh, without going into that survival-based fear place, uh, which makes us just be terrible to one another? And that's why we need all those pacos with the whole hut full of potatoes and rice and textiles. And something like that happens. That's the role of of people like that to give back to the community in times of need. We just don't have a a lot of those types of people right now. Well, no, yeah, we don't because we. We externalized our responsibility. We externalized our personal power. And in some ways that's beautiful and, and powerful because we created systems to take care of it. And in many ways, those systems are very useful and very uh, efficient, but they also require a lot of bureaucracy. And that bureaucracy swallows up some of the good they could do. And I don't think it's about asking more of our systems. I think at this point in time, we have to pretty much assume that our systems are kind of set in stone. Our politics, our, our uh, you know, uh, disaster relief and stuff, that is pretty much set in stone and that it, it's, it's kind of stuck in a bureau, uh, bureaucracy. And this is about as much as they can do at this point in time. Uh, you know, so it's really not about asking more of it. Of course, we can ask more and we can uh, we can point out how it can do more for us. But how, how can we take personal responsibility uh, in our own communities and our own families to uh, provide a type of safety net that isn't that doesn't uh, need the bureaucracy? that doesn't need to answer back to someone else where it went. It's just like, uh, you know, at first when I started the Salkamune Ayu, which I've renamed in English, the Wild Hearts Medicine Society, you know, one of the big reasons I started that was to be a nonprofit so that I could give to the indigenous communities so that I could help uh, with projects such as water and bridges and things like that for them in Peru. But what I really quickly discovered was 
that especially if you get the official, uh, you, you know, nonprofit type of status, your hands get tied in many ways. You can't just decide, hey, I want to help this family because they were displaced. You know, you, you don't have quite that power anymore. So you have to basically decide to give to other organizations that are going to do something. So it becomes a bureaucratic net. It becomes this bureaucratic, uh, um, trying to think of a non-vulgar term for it, but this, this bureaucratic uh, obstacle that makes it so that you're not really uh, making the impact that you once thought you could make. Because instead of being able to directly uh, buy something and give it to a community, you can't do that so much. You have to uh, directly pay another company that's a nonprofit to produce whatever effect you want. And then uh, they uh, go and do it. And, and it's, it's kind of like that. There has to be, you know, it's like contracts and all these other things. So, uh, you know, that was disheartening for me at the time because that wasn't how we were wanting to do it. You know, one of the charities we did was uh, Christmas in the mountains. And that was just where you gay, where I collected a bunch of money and I'd give it to uh, my Waki Chai, my uh, brother Alberto. And I, uh, and he would take it and buy toys and buy uh, televisions and buy foods. And then he would spend two months starting at the end of, November all the way into the, like the middle of January going from orphanage to orphanage because what ends up happening in these indigenous communities is that if they want to uh, make some kind of token economy, some type of money, you know, they either have to go to markets and sell their wares or they take on students if they're uh, Pacos or if they're shamans, but really that's still a rare thing that it's, you know, we, we sometimes romanticize things and think that every person that's indigenous is a, is a shaman of some type. And that's just not the truth. You know, their, their Pacos are very rare in their communities uh, as rare or maybe even rarer than they are in our communities, you know? So, um, uh, so, you know, the, the, their hands are kind of tied because it's still, mm -hmm. Uh, a, a socioeconomic mess in South America, they're still looked at kind of like dogs in their communities. You, you not, not in the indigenous community, but in these uh, quote unquote civilized Spanish communities, the indigenous people are still looked at as lower class, as lower than human, uh, you know, and, and they're not allowed to work and, and they're not allowed to eat in many of the restaurants or be in the hotels when people aren't there doing something. You know, if there's a group down there doing something, then they're welcomed into the hotel. But as soon as they're not. So when those families decide that they want to try to make a better life for themselves somewhere. And usually, sadly, that means that they're, they're going to be employed in things like the drug trade or they're going to be employed in things like prostitution or something like that because they can't get an official job. They can't get they can't just go get hired uh, somewhere. Uh, you you know, and so what they need to do is they have to leave their their children because they can't take their children with them and they don't want to take their children into those type of environments. So they leave them at orphanages. So there's orphanages all over the mountains with kids in them. And so that was one of the charities we did. But uh, on a low level or like a church level type of charity drive, we could do that. But on the larger like, um, you know, uh, the larger nonprofit uh, world, you can't just grab a bunch of money and just give it to some man who uh, is not part of any corporation or anything or uh, nonprofit and just allow him to spend that money uh, the way he sees fit for those orphanages. And so, you know, that, that uh, that's the bureau bureaucracy, the mess. So we have to create systems and put things in place in our own communities and in our own personal lives that will be safety nets for ourselves and for others. Very good. That's amazing. If anybody has questions, comments, or anything that's just on your, your mind or your heart or your soul, feel free to make a comment. We'd love to speak to it. I have the link in the video description and I posted in comments for the upcoming apprenticeship program that starts April 19th and will go for 
eight months. We meet once a month in person. There's a break in July and then it's a hybrid program. So in between when we meet in person, there's online things. And uh, it's the first time we've done something like this. And this is really culminating what we learned in COVID and had to go online along with the in-person. So it's going to be a very exciting yeah, version yeah. Of, of the program. But, uh, but if you have questions or comments on what we've been talking about, now's a great time to, to comment on that. Uh, Ricky does say to Melissa that Luna says good morning too. So we have, have that. And he was also mentioning that he has blue calcite and that, that has helped take off the edge of his anxiety, which is kind of what prompted our whole uh, mm -hmm. weaving of how we got to, to where we're at right now in our conversation is from that anxiety <laughs> question. Yeah. 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 Stones can help. They're, they're a tool that can help in the apprenticeship. Um, and you may find that, that might be a tool that you end up using later on in healing for yourself or other people. It might become one of your sacred pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad it's helping. And I remember the day I gave that to you. I'm like, here, just hold this. <laughs> <laughs> Sit and hold this. <laughs> well, you know, that's something that sparks from when we've had the program with Zane, how we, when we find our stones, how you, you hold it in one hand and, and you tell, you have it tell you its story and you tell it your story and you kind of learn how to have a conversation with them and ask them, this is what I'd like you to do for me. And in a way you start to have a relationship with that. And whether it's a crystal from Goddess Elite or if it's something that you found while on a hike during one of the outings, stones have like their own little wisdom that they have and yep. uh, they become it's hard to describe how you find your stones and, and Zane walks us through how to do that of, of really how the variation is between each one. They really have their own little personalities and you get to get to know them really well over the course of your work. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, that is the basis of all of our spiritual communication, you know, uh, is not just the stones, but learning to communicate with nature and learning the language of, uh, of the divine and not, uh, and not requiring the divine to um, communicate with you in ways that you are understand or are comfortable with. You know, like I said on uh, SOAR a couple of weeks ago, it's about learning how to hallucinate, <laughs> how to, how to uh, step into that realm of hallucinations. And of course I said that uh, because it, it's a very, uh, a very dramatic way of saying uh, it. Uh, but it's uh, one of the most honest ways of saying it, you know, that we're learning uh, the skill of hallucination. Uh, uh, Ricky was just offering that that day that Melissa gave him that stone, he was, she was sick of him. <laughs> 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 and also that he always feels a heartbeat when he finds a stone that wants to work with him. Otherwise, it just feels like a stone. And I, I don't experience it as a heartbeat, but for me, there's just kind of a, a, a sparkle or a shine to it. It just, you just notice it uh, is how I perceive that. And I think that's what Zane already talked about our three centers where we're, we're bringing in inf uh, information, expressing out. It's like learning how to communicate within those different fields of energy. And sometimes with something that needs to communicate from the heart, we're trying with the head and we're missing it. And we got to drop and, and Zane's really good about teaching this dropping from the head and into the heart from the heart. Well, the, the heart is, the uh, you know, that that's really what we're, uh, you know, especially our tradition is a heart-based tradition, a munai-based, uh, meaning munai is the most important quality. After that, yankai, which is what we can do, physically do with our bodies. And the least important is yachai or the mind in our tradition. Uh, you know, we uh, th this tradition is a tradition based on feelings, not structures. So uh, that is very important. And the way that you just expressed that like he feels the heartbeat in the stone and you see a light or it shines to you that that's what we're doing is we're waking those qualities up uh, for us we're dialing in what's right for us and the tradition allows us to dial in it doesn't say oh it's strictly this way and only this way it allows you to have your one-on-one -on -one experience and for you to honor that one-on-one -on -one experience because that's how you dial it in so what is a shine to one person might be a heartbeat to another person. And to honor that, even if you're the only person that you talk to that gets the heartbeat or gets the shine, to honor it because that, that is a knowing of how you interact with the divine, how you can uh, communicate on the divine level, because everything is divine, you know. And, mm -hmm. and we'll get into all that in the program, but it, it really is... 
and what we in the West call image and similitude uh, with the universe. Now, Melissa probably runs into that a lot more, like people coming in and um, to develop their gifts and things with the different programs you have and wanting to compare how they're receiving information to someone else. And we kind of, we have a, we think that we're doing it wrong if we don't have the same result. And yeah. And that's all up here. Yeah. You know, that, that's us trying to control the experience in our mind. And the mind is not where the experience happens. That, that's the hardest thing in the West is for us to let go of the fact that we think it all happens in the mind, but the mind is just a negation machine. And if we uh, operate in the sacred with the mind and with the mind alone, what we're going to end up doing is just driving ourselves insane because we're going to say, oh, that doesn't feel like it did last time. Oh, I don't think this is this isn't the poetic expression someone else gave me for this, you know. And words are imperfect. The mind is imperfect. It does. It. It's not about about understanding these things. It's about experiencing them. I, I think there's also um, this perception that when you're taking a class, the teacher is the end all be all, and what they say goes. And if there's not the flexibility in the description of like this may vary then it's like it has to be this way or it's wrong because the teacher said this happens when you do X, Y, Z, B, C is your result. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I mean, even as a perfect example, I remember um, it was part of that death rights weekend and we had came back from doing the waterfall where you were supposed to put yourself over and do all this other stuff. And you had asked people like what they were experiencing and you were asking to get the variations to come out first without saying right up front, like, don't worry, it might be different. You were just kind of gauging and listening to what other people had experienced. I'm like, oh, shit, I didn't do this right. Like, <laughs> I wasn't off visiting family. I didn't see this. I didn't see, you know something completely different. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut because <laughs> I can do this right. And later come to find out, no, it, it was right. And there were two other people um, who had a similar type of experience as I did, but all three of us were kind of like, we're just gonna be quiet. And it wasn't until later after those who had shared, you're like, yes, these are different um, experiences and here's why certain people see this way. And they went, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's all about honoring your experience the way it comes to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, that's where I think, too, sometimes, um, you know, if, if there's not that upfront, it's going to be different for every person, which you're good at. But it was just my own, you know, like anxiety in that moment going, I didn't do it right because it didn't match the first two or three people who were talking. But um, in a lot of classes and workshops that, you know, I've sat in or, you know, have hosted in the store. I'm certified in this and I teach this. I've been doing this for so long. Here's the information I'm giving to you. And it's kind of like, it is this way or no way. You know, Mandalorian, it is the way. <laughs> so, um, you know, sometimes there's not the perception that there is that wiggle room. And yeah. that's the great thing about this tradition. There is so much wiggle room in discovery zones that it makes it easier to make it applicable for everyday life for every person sitting in that room learning. Um, yeah. One thing I like to say is it's not about me. I'm the teacher, but it's not about me. It's about you and your experience and what you, you know, it really is about the student. It's really about the community and what they, and what they get from it. And that's really uh, the quality there. And a lot of traditions and a lot of teachers, well, partly the traditions are young. So they're trying to compete or they they have something that's very powerful and they're trying to preserve it and they're trying to make sure it doesn't get corrupted. And they go about it in a very, um, very strict way because that's the way our culture is. Our culture is a culture of the scientific fact. So we we look for data points and then we compile all those data points. Then we say, oh, this this A, B equals C and it always equals C. And mystical traditions and spiritual traditions, A and B does not always equal the same thing. Uh, you know, just uh, people who do Reiki, 
Reiki doesn't always feel the same exact way every time you run it. Sometimes you feel a current, sometimes you don't, sometimes your hands get hot, sometimes they get cold, sometimes you don't feel anything at all. And all of these things, and your experience of it doesn't change the quality of the work that you're giving. And people get in their heads about that too. Oh, I just, I'm not feeling it right today. It's not working right for me. And whenever all that's happening, you're up here. And this thing is a really bad orchestrator for the spiritual world. This is where we really can receive and experience the, that stuff. This is a much stronger processor. And dropping down into our heart allows us to have deeper experiences and to honor those experiences. But if we, it, it, because the mind's a negation machine. It just is comparing things, us and them all the time, us and that, <laughs> this and that, what's right, what's wrong. Uh, is it safe? Is it dangerous? And that's what it's supposed to do. So we actually learn how to um, drop out of that center into another center and to operate in it and then to honor the mind later, to allow ourselves to use the mind to explore the experience after it's happened, not during because the mind stops the experience. That is really good. Mind stops the experience, a good thing to keep in mind. Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had Ricky just, or Richie. I keep getting, because Ricky was on the stream earlier and I just keep going back and forth by accident saying Ricky or Richie. But Richie was saying that he, he had the same similar situation where he was just seeing silhouettes, but everybody else in a journey type of experience was having like a full color movie. And it's really easy to get tripped up when that happens, thinking that you're missing out on something. Uh, Karen was saying that she always worries about doing it wrong. And uh, Chair Bear is just echoing the mind stops the experience. Yeah, it's not created to live within the mystical. The mystical yeah. is an experience, not an understanding. But I'm just going to read this because if I put the comment up, it makes you completely disappear because it's a longer comment. But Judy was saying that the conversation has been very affirming for her and she uh, uh, that I often don't know why I do or believe something. I, it's hard to weather the challenges and questioning. Thank you uh, for saying that I don't have to know why and that my experience doesn't have to match others. And, you know, sometimes you when you know that you know that you know or you just have a knowing to try to disseminate it down to the mind kind of um, – I want to use the word dilutes it like, you know, but now you have to articulate how, you know, or why, you know, but you know, it's just knowing without a reason. There's no rhyme or reason. You sometimes just have a knowing and you, you can't explain why mm -hmm. or how, you know, you just know. And Richie says, there's really no right or wrong way to experience things. A hundred percent brother. Yeah, that's, that's the truth. And that's the <laughs> only way that we can grow as individuals is to honor our experiences uh, and because our experiences are our teachers and that's how we go from uh trying to learn something to being something yeah and that's what the program really is is it is a container that zane and we all create that you have your own experience and then it doesn't matter what trivia zane teaches you you've had your own experience now that you can start really starting to build upon you know, your own discipline and your own tradition, you know, inspired by the Qatar tradition. And that's, that's Absolutely. what it's all about. Yeah. It's just like in the past, I, I, um, because the language, uh, the Quechua language has so many beautiful, juicy little words to describe <laughs> experiences that traditionally the Western language and English didn't have, but especially since the advent of computer science and and as, uh, as we uh, dive deeper and deeper into extrapolating our own consciousness into other machines and stuff, we have started to develop a language for it. And I'm happy about that because that makes it a lot easier to teach these things. Uh, because one of the things that has historically happened is you bring up a Quechua word and then people trying to get a, a solid understanding and definition of that word trips them up from uh, having the experience itself. Because Quechua is a flowery language, is a poetic language, meaning there are certain words that mean certain things, but they can all mean different things in different contexts. 
And that is hard for an English speaking person or even a Spanish speaking person to sometimes understand that there is this uh, wide uh, swath of usefulness in a word. Just like you can use Sami or you could use Kausai or you can use Kanchai and you can use any of those words interchangeably, but then you can become more definite and use exactly one word and uh, to express just one aspect. But in another way, you could use one of the other words to express that aspect as well. So, you know, that really uh, drives the Western mind crazy. And we're also hypothetical thinkers. And the Quechua mind just wasn't like that. So getting more like that as we have uh, uh, intercourse uh, or interactions with one another, we're getting uh, more like each other. But, uh, you know, they weren't a questioning culture. Yeah. Um, for the most part, questions were, uh, questions are, are more, I don't know how to ex explain it, kind of like mind candy for the Western world. We like to think of things and philosophize about things, and they don't have a lot of time for that because their life is practical and it's about survival. So they have to get right to survival and sitting there having some lofty hypothetical thought about something really doesn't help them survive, really doesn't help them get to the next day or produce what they need to produce. In fact, it can take them away from it because even something that's completely made up in the mind has physiological effects on us. It changes the way that we're able to do things in this reality. Even if it's just a mind question that we're playing around with, a hypothetical, we can drive ourselves crazy, create anxiety states, create depression states, and lose the ability to, uh, to uh, act in a certain situation because we are creating an internal, completely made up uh, emergency state that we're having to deal with that has no basis in reality whatsoever. Two things. One, um, we should talk a little bit before we end here for people who are still on. One, uh, you are being called to this program and you looked at the website, you don't think it's possible, please reach out. We like to be as accommodating as we can to people who are really hearing the call. Uh, but the other thing is we have the eclipse coming up on Monday and I know Melissa has a whole bunch of special things going on at the store. So if we could talk about Eclipse just for a brief moment and Melissa can share with us what uh, what you have going on at the store and maybe Zane can give everybody a little, just a little bit of homework leading to the Eclipse to get the most out of it. A little synopsis from last week's talk. That would be really cool when Melissa can stall talking about the store events while Zane thinks about the homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that bus, love it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so during the day, uh, starting at 11 a.m., Greg is offering uh, mediumship, psychic mediumship readings um, up until about 2.30 um, to give time for everybody to be outside through the eclipse. Um, and then that evening, uh, we will be doing a like mini psychic fair, a uh, handful of readers who psychic medium astrology based uh, to get readings with that energy. Um, even though technically it'll be over with, we're still kind of in that energy, uh, depending on how much you get into astrology. I hear it's a lot. Um, so we will be offering um, that um, day and evening. So very good. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I guess, um, you know, we, we talked last week about the traditional understandings of what something like an eclipse is, is the dying of the light is kind of like the solst uh, the winter solstice. It has the same kind of energy in a sense, but it's different. It's also like the energy of a, a new moon. So it's, it's a dark period. So leading up to that, really it's about, uh, you know, what are your ideals? What would you, who is the you you want to become? How do you want to behave? How do you want to act? And, and then going into that uh, period of the eclipse, allowing yourself to go into the dark corners of your life and seeing where you don't live up to those expectations and nurturing those things, allowing them to come up, allowing yourself to, to clearly see them, not to just shove them away, not to just acknowledge them and shove them away, but to allow them to kind of bubble up a little bit because the light is soft. It won't burn them. It, 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 uh, you can you won't don't have to hold 
the hard idealistic uh, lens onto them. Just let them come up, observe them, observe what you're wanting to become, and then reach out from the core being of yourself with a heartfelt prayer to the divine saying, you know, the things, uh, the ways that you're not living up to who you want to be. And, and also asking the divine to show you a grounded way of being those things, because some of these high ideals may not be able to manifest in your reality. You may not be able to do that. So why throw so much energy toward that goal that that's unattainable where there are other goals that are attainable. And as the light comes back, allowing yourself to be reprogrammed, allowing yourself to receive a brand new code of light, a brand new, uh, uh, co a brand new way of behaving, a brand new way of understanding the universe around you. Allow it to t to communicate to you wh who, how you can bet closest get to who you would like to be. Yeah, and just for everybody's awareness, when it comes to that experience, what Zane just talked about, regardless of if the clouds are there or not, you can use the energy of that eclipse to do this uh, this exercise and recommendation. So, um, regardless of clouds. Yeah, uh, please, please listen to the homework. Uh, anything else from either of you before I hit the end button? Um, so my Twitch friends, we are actually going to raid into a local artist um, who is live doing art. Um, local guys support local artist people. But um, I'm good. Very good. Well, we'll <laughs> see you all. I think Zane won't be on next week because he has an event down in Athens. So yeah, that's we, true. That's true. So, I forgot. So, yeah, well, I'm reminding you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, so it will be just Melissa and I, but if you have questions uh, between now and next week, please comment them or message us. We love The best thing is for us to interact off of your comments, as you can see, just from the few questions we had today, how it just created an entire, you know, an entire, you know, dance with the information in a way uh, from your questions. So we have people just saying thank you and goodbye. Thank you all. We will catch you uh, next week. And until then, Anaiki Kawaiki.